Let's bow our heads as we prepare for the teaching of God's Word. Utilizing 1 John 1 9 if necessary, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's important that we're in fellowship so that the Holy Spirit can teach us the Word of God. salvation, but actually do not. Um, there are a list of uh, close to 80, over 80 passages that some people try to use to say that you can lose your salvation. And I tried to classify these passages in a reasonable answer of how you deal with these passages that seem to appear that a believer can lose their salvation. And we started out with the first one. I think the problem is taking some passages dealing with the uh, second tense salvation and trying to apply it to first tense salvation, meaning you have to persevere in order to go to heaven. We dealt with those passages, so the first objection would be, or first response would be, there's passages that people use to confuse, They're, they confuse the three tenses of salvation. And this is where people think automatically when I see the word saved, it means go to heaven. But many times it can mean saved from sin's power and even being saved from sin's presence. The three tenses of salvation, of course, are we're saved from sin's power when we believe in Christ. That's the penalty of sin. We're saved from sin's uh, presence uh, or power in, as we... Uh, Take in the word of God and grow in grace. This is called sanctification. But we say from the very presence of sin, that is called glorification. And then there's the word of saved means can, can be delivered from physical enemies. As David said, save me from my enemies. So the word salvation doesn't automatically mean go to heaven. We have to take the context and apply passages appropriately that uh, refer to first, second, or third, ten salvation. We address number two, scriptures that dispensationally are confused, such as dealing with the tribulation period, he that endured to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, what's the end and how is the word saved, how is the word saved used there? And that's referring to Jews who endure physically the end of the tribulation. They will be physically saved or delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. A lot of people try to use that verse to say, I've got to keep persevering or in order to go to heaven. And that has nothing to do with the context there at all. Those passages, they are dispensationally misapplied. Then we're dealing with number three. Uh, really, we're dealing with passages which speak of divine discipline and not hell. Those who say you can lose your salvation will look at these passages and say, well, surely the judgment here is hell if you fail to live a godly life. And that's not true. If we fail to live a godly life as genuine believers in Christ, we experience God's divine discipline. And uh, we've already looked at several of these passages. Today we will begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So if you have your Bibles, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 11, 29 through 32. 1 Corinthians 11, 29 through 32. In the context, this passage deals with those of uh, those individuals at Corinth who were coming to communion drunk. Uh, they were disorderly. They were uh, eating ahead of others. Uh, they didn't wait on the poor believers. They were bringing their own meals. They were not sharing. Um, really, they, they were behaving in a disorderly manner. 
And because of this, Paul says, many have experienced God's divine discipline in three stages. Notice verse 20, verse 30. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Right there we have three stages of divine discipline. Physical weakness is the first stage. There are those who are physically weak because of their disorderly conduct, because of their carnal, carnal actions around the Lord's Supper. And then those who are weak that did not confess their sins experience stage two divine discipline, illness, physical illness. Now again, not all physical illness is a sign of divine discipline, obviously. But some can be. Understand that. Some illness can be a reason cause. The reason for that is divine discipline. And then thirdly, many have died. Many have died. God implemented the ultimate judgment of taking a believer home early. The word sleep is interesting because it's only used of believers in the New Testament. So he's not talking about someone who lost salvation because that person is still saved. As a matter of fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And there refer, he's referring to Christians. The idea there is using the metaphor of sleep, picturing death for the believer. That metaphor of sleeping is never used of death for the unbeliever. So it does show you that these people are still saved, but they have died the sin of physical death. What is the remedy? The remedy found in verse 31 is self-judgment. If, if we want to avoid God's divine judgment or discipline, we need to judge ourselves. For if we were to judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Now what is self-judgment? Self-judgment is naming your sins. And we own up to our sins. So you commit as a believer personal sin, we don't say, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I'll never do that again. That's not confession. Uh, oh Lord, I'm going to be better this week, so I promise that this week I'm going to try to do some good things to try to cancel out the bad things I did last week. It doesn't work that way. You don't have to do penance. That's a Catholic view of uh, confession. i got to I got to do something to cancel out my bad deeds. i got to make up for it somehow. Well, Jesus Christ died on the cross for that sin. In 1 John 1, 9, we simply acknowledge. Humble get those or confess. Own up to it. I always say the fill in the blank. I, whatever the sin is, I lied or I did this. Whatever that sin is, it's an ownership. Just like a child that got her hand caught in the cookie jar. I took those cookies when you told me not to eat those before breakfast or supper or lunch. <laughs> Uh, I did that. Did you do that? Own up to it. Fess up. That's basically confession. We hear the word fess up. Own up to it. So we want to avoid divine discipline. We have to own up to our personal sins. Acting as your own judge and jury. I act as my own judge. Yes, I did this. And you not acknowledge that to God. Now, but if we refuse to do that, when we are disciplined, verse 32, this is where divine discipline kicks in. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. And by the way, that same word is used in Hebrews 12, and it's chastening as sons. So we know he's talking to believers here. Believers who are chastened, but they don't lose your salvation. They're chastened as children of God. They still belong to him. So when we are chastened by the Lord, that we might not be, what, condemned with the world. It shows we're not lumped in with the world. Okay. Uh, therefore, my brethren, notice here, now he addressed Christians. These same believers who were disorderly at communion, he says, when you come together, wait, tarry for another believer. Don't go ahead and, you know, eat your lunch and don't share with anyone else. And they, many times they came together to share a fellowship, what's called a fellowship meal around communion, and many times we practice a, a fellowship meal, at least once a month, but sometimes we, the, the timing is, we, we practice that along with communion. But uh, they usually came together to break bread and eat and share, but many of them were going ahead and doing their own thing. 
But if one's hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. So here he's speaking here not of judging and going to hell. These individual Christians who uh, did not acknowledge their sins, did not exercise self-judgment, were disciplined by God with three stages of divine discipline. Okay, let's take a look at the, the next passage here on our list. Uh, let's take a look here at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 through 7. 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7. The Apostle Paul wrote this to a young pastor, teacher Timothy. Uh, he was exhorting Timothy about other false teachers. He says in verse 3, As I urge you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Nor give heed to fables, mythology, endless genealogies. You know, they have several years ago the fad, the Bible codes. You know, don't you know that 9-11 is predicting the Bible? I said, really, where? Where? Well, if you uh, skip every 10th letter, sometimes it works out to the 12th letter, but if you skip every 10th letter and then take another phrase and go this way and that way and then the Hebrew and transliterate that in English, it says 9-11 plain judgment. Really. And uh, I think you can do that with any book. It's been proven you can do that with some of the uh, Plato's works as well, you know, just, and it's pre-programmed to pick and choose what you want. But people got caught up in so-called Bible codes. We're not interested on in reading the Bible itself. We're really interested in the code beneath the Bible, really. The Bible under the Bible. And that shows you it's distraction from the truth. It's mythos, it's fables, it's myths. It's uh, not profitable. And the Jews were going into genealogies, genealogical records, and the Bible does mention some genealogies and histories, family trees. We need to make the connections. There's some interesting things. But they were going the meaning of every name, and then they were saying this name means that thing, and that means this person, that means this event will happen because of that. And so that was just an endless, you know, practice, uh, and that wasn't any, didn't profit them any bit at all of godliness. He said, these cause arguments. Well, no, it's not the 12th letter that you skip. It's the 15th letter. Well, that person's name means this instead of that. It's like, come on, guys, really? <laughs> it causes endless disputes rather than what? What's the goal of Scripture? Godly edification, which is by faith. Okay. What's the goal, ultimate goal of studying doctrine? Just so they will know more? No. The godly, the purpose of the command is love from a pure heart. That's the highest Christian virtue, agape love. The study of scripture should produce love through us, the virtue of Christ. The goal of the commandment is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and from a genuine faith. Now here he speaks about some who have deviated from that. They're genuine believers, but they have deviated from that sound doctrine, sound teaching. They really have apostatized from the truth. Which some, having strayed, have turned away to idle talk. They want to be teachers of the law, you know, set themselves up as, you know, the authority. And these are Jewish legalizers, more than likely. They want to communicate the law, and uh, just like the Pharisees, lay heavy burdens upon people. Understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. They don't even know the truth themselves, but they want to teach others. And they have deviated what? The thing is they've deviated from genuine teaching. That, that which is sound in faith. So he's warning Timothy about these individuals. Now we jump down to um, verses 18 to 20. 18 to 20. He charges Timothy here, uh, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them he may wage a good warfare. You're in it. You're in a spiritual battle. Fight a good fight. Having faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected. Notice here, these are genuine believers that they made shipwreck concerning the faith. Notice this phrase. Concerning the faith have suffered shipwrecked. And he mentions two individuals here. 
of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, people would say you can lose your salvation. Look at these two individuals. They stayed straight away from the truth, and therefore they've lost their salvation. And that's not the case. That's not the case. Now, let's begin here with having faith and a good conscience. Now, I have some notes here that um, this word is translated in the NIV, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Obviously, these individuals did not hold on to faith in a good conscience. They were abandoning the truth. They made shipwreck concerning the faith. Their faith was definitely shipwrecked against the rocks of heresy, as one writer puts it. Now, the word shipwreck in verse 19 means to break a ship to pieces. That's what happens when you wreck a ship. They break the ship to pieces and suffer, they suffer ruin. Concerning the faith, they have broken it to pieces. They have Abandon the truth. And Hymenaeus and Alexander names names. Now, you know, I've had people in the past, well, don't name certain denominations that teach false doctrine. You know, don't name individuals. And the Bible names individuals who have taught false doctrine. And I can name individuals such as John MacArthur who teaches a lordship gospel. Beware, it's a false gospel. You can name individuals, Bob and Paul does, names individuals. Because people need to be aware of these false teachers. They used to hold to the truth, but now they've abandoned the truth. They have made shipwreck of the faith. And Paul, in his apostolic authority, and key, again, pastors are not apostles. Although the pastor teacher is the highest gift after the completion of the word of God. The apostles, though, were, was the highest gift in the church age. How do you know that? 1 Corinthians 11, he says, first apostles, second prophets, then teachers. He gave a specific order of authority in usage of spiritual gifts. But his authority, Paul, as an apostle, was to turn these individuals over for divine discipline. We had the phrase, they're delivered to Satan. Now, people look at that and say, well, they lost their salvation. No, they're delivered to Satan in the sense as Job... Job's case, Job, God permitted Satan to touch Job's body, but not to take his life. Remember that? God, even a God, and Job was a godly man. And God, though, had a good purpose in Job's suffering. These individuals, though, will be handed over to Satan for, you know, God's disciplinary action. And that's the difference. They're going to be turned over to Satan. And allow Satan to afflict them and torment them. And uh, there's so a corrective thing in this. They may learn. The word learn means it's a word used for correcting a child. That uh, they may be corrected so that they will not blast him in the future. So I think Paul was hoping that these individuals would turn around. He's handing them over to divine discipline. He's turning them over to Satan. Uh, the Apostle Paul exercised his authority to put them out of the fellowship of the local church and into Satan's destructive domain of the world. Now, there's another individual in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, that was handed over to Satan. This individual was uh, committing immorality and... Um, he was sleeping with his own mother. Some say stepmother. His father's wife could be his own mother. Uh, this was well known in the church. Uh, this was unconfessed. It was blatant. Uh, this individual was still attending the local assembly. The church knew about it. And they were not doing anything about it. It was affecting other people in their walking relationship. It was pulling their carnality. It was pulling down other people. And Paul says, you need to discipline this guy. Exercise church discipline. And uh, this guy needs to be kicked out. Kicked out of your local assembly because he's corrupting other believers. It's a shameful thing. It doesn't represent Christ. And so notice Paul says, deliver such a one to Satan. There's another individual. But this individual, though, is saved. We've dealt with this. 
He's delivered to save for the destruction of the flesh. Here, though, the purpose of delivering here is ultimate death. Ultimate death. And notice that would be the sin of the physical death, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He'll still go to heaven. But this guy will suffer physical death. And he warns the church that the, uh, allowing this to go on in assembly will affect other people. Little eleven, what does it do the whole, whole lump? It pervas pervasively affects the whole lump. And therefore, you need to purge out the leaven. You need to purge this guy out of the assembly. He doesn't need to continue to practice that. And apparently, in 2 Corinthians, this guy repented. And they even didn't let him back in. Paul had to write a letter. you got to let this guy back in so he might not drown in sorrow. This guy came back to the Lord and it says time for him to come back to the assembly uh, in 2 Corinthians. If he's referring to the same individual, I believe he is. So another example then, of course, is this man who is living in sexual immorality before God. So whether doctrinal apostasy or moral apostasy, God takes it seriously. And believers can apostatize in both ways. Well, Christian can, can commit that sin or that sin. Any sin that an unbeliever can commit, a Christian can commit that sin. That's very important. Because there are those who teach that, well, if that person commits that sin, he was never, he was never saved in the first place. And this is called the false doctrine of perseverance of the saints. And the Bible doesn't say that our perseverance is guaranteed. The Bible says our security is guaranteed. But it's the preservation of the saints is the biblical doctrine, not the perseverance of the saints. God's preservation of the saints. So these individuals are turned over to Satan under divine discipline. That doesn't mean they lose salvation. But the turning over is for the purpose of not blaspheming God through teaching false doctrine. Now, the Greek term for learn, paiduo, uh, we get the word paideia, pedagogue, is where we get our English word pedagogue. This chastening action was temporal and pedagogical for the purpose of correction, with a view toward restoring their fellowship with God and the rest of the church. So the idea is corrective in nature. He's handed over to Satan here so that he might be corrected and learn not to blaspheme. Now obviously in 2 Timothy this individual continues in his false doctrine. I think we have a cross reference here in the book of 2 Timothy. Um, let's see, I had it here. But um, 2 Timothy, this guy shows up again in think, chapter 2. And uh, they're teaching that the resurrection is past. And they overthrow the faith of some. I think we have it in our notes here. But uh, this guy continues uh, the, in his uh, rebellion. And ultimately, I think, this individual, under divine discipline, if he didn't, he didn't um, acknowledge his sin, the Lord's going to take him home early in judgment. Now, let's take a look at 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. There's a trap, though, of wealth. Uh, wealth can be a trap. It doesn't have to be. Uh, there are wealthy individuals who were godly in the Bible. The Bible doesn't condemn having money. Keep that in mind when you vote in the fall. <laughs> the Bible doesn't condemn wealth and wealth creators. People like to throw rocks at people who are wealthy. What's wrong? They're providing the jobs. You want to take what they have and let the people be poor. It's ridiculous. Let's attack the job creators. They have too much money. Well, how much is enough? Too much, right? But for the believer, though, it can be a trap if we put our confidence in wealth instead of God. And that's what Paul tells Timothy. Notice he didn't say those who are rich. Notice what the text says. That's why you have to pay close attention to the text. For those who desire to be rich, meaning that's your goal in life. My goal in life is to retire early and I'm going to have all these wealth. I don't have to worry about anything. Just like the man, he says, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. No consideration of God and his plans. Well, you're going to die tonight. 
Your soul's going to be required of you. Then who shall these things be? Like Solomon said, you know, it's kind of vanity to work hard all your life and leave your goods to an idiot who will waste it. <laughs> you work hard all your life while you're sweating labor and leave it to someone who don't care and appreciate what you have. But that's all under issue. <laughs> but those who desire to be rich fall into what? Temptations and the snare. And the many foolish and hurtful desires, lusts, which drown in dest destruction, meaning, you know, can destroy your life, ruin or wreck your life, and judgment. For the love of money is the root, not of all evil, all kinds of evil. See, different types of evil is not the, money is not the root of all evil. That's why people misquote scripture. Love money is the root of all category, all different types of evil. For some have what? Strayed from the faith. These are believers who have veered from the truth. In their greediness, the desire to acquire more and more and more. You know what that lifestyle does? I don't have time for church. I don't have time to read my read the Bible. I'm too busy acquiring wealth. I have a business. You know, if you have a job, I've always said that if you have a job that prevents you from attending church, find another job. We're here for one purpose. It's to honor and glorify the Lord. You know, and uh, that should be our number one goal, not to have a cozy retirement and do all this. You are here to follow Him. God will provide for us. So we have to, we have to pursue a relationship with Him. Some, though, have pursued money instead of the Lord. These believers have veered from the faith, have taken a side turn in their greediness. And notice they suffer self-induced misery. I like the way it's translated here. They pierce themselves through with many sorrows. You know, they're hurting themselves because of their pursuit of material wealth. With a lot of money comes a lot of responsibility. And even uh, uh, there's more things to take care of. And more, it absorbs more of your time and effort. And uh, it doesn't bring you happiness. Notice that. Does that say money bring, brings you happiness? Many sorrows. It's the exact opposite. Having that desire. But if God prospers you as you seek a relationship with him, then that can be a blessing. That additional material wealth can be a blessing. But it's what's your heart? God wants to know what's your, where is your heart? And uh, my point is, these people strayed from the faith. Now, look at Luke 8, 14. In the parable of the soils, I think we have the same thing here. And it's a shame that these, this parable has been misinterpreted. We have seed that falls on stony ground that doesn't germinate. Obviously, Satan snatches the one that falls by the wayside, that refers to an unbeliever. But I believe the next three refers to believers. See, those who believe in what's called perseverance of the saints, they say really the only person who's saved is the one who produces fruit. Therefore, number two and three, they're unbelievers. I don't agree with that. I, I think that the carnal Christians, the, okay, let's do it. Number one is an unsaved person. Number two and three, carnal believer. Number three, spiritual believer. Or number four, spiritual believer. If you want to look at the four, the soils. Okay, verse 12. So, you know the parable that sower went, went, went out to sow and throw seed and it falls on various ground. The ones on the wayside are the ones who hear. When the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They're distracted. Have you ever tried to witness to someone and all of a sudden telephone rings or a child screams or cries or someone else or another person comes by and interrupts a conversation? Many times that Satan kind of snatching your, taking away their attention. Don't want you to hear the gospel and believe. I want you to think about this, this that, 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 that. You know, I don't want you to be focused on your eternal destiny. And I think many times Satan loves to cause distractions to and when given the gospel, he wants to take that before the seed germinates. Life comes, this is very important agriculturally, 
I don't be so simple like a certain politician. Well, all, all you need to do to be a farmer is just put a seed in the ground and water it and it'll grow, really. Oh, okay. But the Bible puts it pretty simply here that a seed doesn't have life until it germinates. That's the key, germination. Not fruit. I can have a tree that's alive that doesn't have fruit. Right? Had a peach tree in the backyard like that. Now eventually it did die. Peach tree was still alive. It blossomed but didn't have any fruit. You can have believers without fruit. They're still believers. The only thing, that the seed, that whatever seed you plant in the ground, it's alive once it sprouts. As soon as it germinates, it has life. That's the key to the interpretation here. As soon as it germinates, it has life. The seed did not germinate here in the first case. Uh, the person's unsaved. Number two, 13, verse 13. Here another, but the ones on the rock are those when they hear, receive the word of joy. That's not a fake and phony joy. The same word is used in the book of Acts of genuine believers. They welcome the word of God. They were joyful. And those who have no root, that's why the Paul says we need to be rooted and grounded in the truth. We need the word of God will be like a tree planted by what? Living waters. In Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, we need to be rooted and ground in the word in Ephesians. So these have no roots. It takes time to develop roots. It's shallow. So just superficial. It's, it, it, it's on the rock. And they believe for a while. Notice, believe. Notice, you don't have to believe the rest of your life in order to go to heaven. <laughs> Just believe one time the gospel. One time. You're justified by faith. You're born again at that point forever. That's all. I don't have to believe the rest of my life in order to go to heaven. Now, it's good that I do. There's many benefits that, that happened when I was a believer to live by faith. And just show what live by faith. But I need to only believe the gospel once. So they did believe, you know. And the problem with Calvinists, they say, well, they had a head faith, not a heart faith. Well, Mr. Calvinist, explain to me what that is. So I said before, they miss heaven by 18 inches or whatever. I don't know what the distance between your head and your heart. Uh, no, the Bible says either they believe or don't believe. It doesn't have this head faith versus heart faith nonsense. Um, they believe. You either believe the truth or don't. And I said, you know, it's clearly people exercise faith every day, but all of a sudden when you talk about biblical faith, they tend to psychologize it. And I tell you something that Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States. Do you believe that? Yeah. Do you not believe that? No. It's not like, oh, I don't know. How do I feel about that? <laughs> you know? It's either true or not. And you either believe it or you don't. You don't get this mystical kind of no man's land of, I believe, but I really didn't believe. You know, it's like, you know. Um, but anyway, they believe. They believe for a period of time. They were trucking with, you know, beginning Christian life. What happened? The time of temptation, they fall away. And so when temptation hits, they veer off. They go back into the world system. Uh, they stop reading the scripture. They you know, go out with their friends, whatever. There are believers like that. They start out well, but they don't fin finish well. It's not a matter of just starting well in the Christian life. It's finishing your course. That's our goal as believers here. We want to finish our race strong. We want to win. Paul says, I want the prize. And you don't get the prize by quitting as a believer. You got to continue. So testing. Another, the, another uh, distraction is the cares of this life. Now this parallels our text in 1 Timothy. The one that fell among the thorns are those who heard go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life. Can Christians be distracted by cares? What did Jesus say? You know, cast all your care upon him. He cares about you. Don't be anxious about anything. Remember in Philippians. Okay. Can believers be anxious? Yes. Can we be distracted with the details of life? The pleasures of life? Well, 
Yes, all these things can be distractions for Christians. Here's the key. They bring no fruit to maturity. Now we're going to look at Hebrews 6 down the road. Hebrews 6 speaks about believers who were starting out well, going back to the old time religion and Judaism, and failing to reach spiritual maturity, and not being a fruit bearer. Even the branch that abides in the vine, Look at John chapter 15. There's four stages of fruit bearing. No fruit, more fruit, much fruit, prolific fruit bearing, fruit that abides. No fruit, more fruit, much fruit, fruit that abides. So there's various stages of fruit. And there's various amounts of fruit bearing. Later on, there's a parable of the list, some 30, 60, you know, 100 fold. Some fruit trees bear more than others. And uh, so it's not a matter of you know, here uh, not being saved. It, they don't continue to maturity. They're, they're distracted by the world system, really. That's what 1 John 2 says, not to what? Love the world. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. Can Christians love the world? Yeah. Can Christians be distracted by the cares of this life and by the pleasures and pursuing what feels good? Instead of what God wants? Yeah. And Phil grows a Christian? Yes. So I think that's the situation we have here. Don't, Timothy, don't get wrapped up in those things. Don't get distracted by those things. You know, there's, there's some things that come along with having abundance of wealth and trusting in that. It can bring misery into your life. Now, what about the ones that fell on the good ground? Those are the ones having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with endurance. And then if you compare the parallel passages in Matthew, you know, there's several other things that are associated with it. They persevere, they continue under doctrine, and they endure. They endure through tribulation, and they're, they're winners, not quitters. And those are the ones who will bear prolific fruit. It's all about fruit bearing. You plant a seed with the purpose of what? Bearing fruit. Now, some people just like the looks of plants. That's fine. Like my daughter. Although I think she does want to produce, produce something, whether she's growing spices or whatever. But the goal of going to plant a, you know, a garden of tomatoes, I want to see tomatoes, not just little sprouts. I have the goal of planting corn, I want to see corn. You know? God planted the seed in you. He wants to see fruit in your life. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness. God wants that Christian virtue produced through you. So this parable of the soil has been misinterpreted, saying, well, these are only fake believers, not real believers. Uh, this is only true believers. But that would say that every believer bears fruit. Why would Paul warn Timothy? See? Don't be distracted by this, Timothy. Don't be like the soil here. So many have strayed from the faith. These are genuine believers. You have to have faith to stray from it. You think about that? You have to have faith to stray from it. And uh, they don't lose their salvation, but you know they receive self-induced misery, pierce themselves through many sorrows. Notice instead, though, the contrast, verse eleven. But you, O man of God, flee these things. Worldly pursuits, pursuit of wealth. And pursue what? What should you pursue, believer? Here's what you should pursue, believer. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight that good fight of faith. Remember our sword and shield in Ephesians 6. Fight the good fight of faith. And then he says, lay hold on eternal life. That doesn't mean you don't have eternal life. That's called the abundant life. Lay hold of the abundant life. Jesus Christ said in John 8, I've come to give life and that more abundant. The abundant life, the fruit bearing life, the life that pleases God. You, Timothy, ignore these distractions. Don't get caught up in the world, but pursue Christian virtue. Okay. Now let's take a look at um, the next passage in Chapter uh, 6, we looked at 9 and 10. Let's look at Hebrews 6. Now we're going to go into Hebrews 6, 4 through 9. 
Now we're not going to do it uh, in this amount of detail as we did in our Hebrew series. We do have that on MP3, a verse by verse teaching through the book of Hebrews. We're just going to touch on it briefly here. But uh, we do want to look at this passage that some use to try to prove loss of salvation. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Let's go back here to 5.11 because really the context begins back here. If you would like to begin um, and uh, verse, verse uh, chapter 6 but really 5.11. Okay, the author of the Hebrews was teaching certain things about the person Christ, including Christ as our great high priest. And this is a difficult doctrine. He's drawing some typology out of the Old Testament. And he says, at this point, we have a lot to say about the subject, but you become dull of hearing. Now, this is not the dull preacher, it's a dull listener. <laughs> it's one of my favorite verses of preacher. It's not the preacher that's dull here. Now, preachers can be dull, unfortunately. Hopefully I'm not boring you this morning. But he says, you're dull of hearing, the dull listener. You're lazy and you're hearing, really. Dull means the idea of laziness and hearing. Because people don't want to go to church to take in doctrine and listen to a lecture for an hour because it takes work. I know it does. It takes effort. To pay attention, not be distracted, take notes if you like or not. If you don't like it, some people do, that's fine. Don't. But... Pay attention. Uh, it's easy to be distracted. That's why people want entertainment. And I think in one sense they're lazy. They're lazy. Don't become lazy in your hearing. Oh, okay, all right, that's fine. Hey, what's for lunch, show? And the problem with these people, they've been to church for decades. Some say at least 30 years we're talking about the Jerusalem church here. Think about from 80, 33 to 80, 70. So they're in the church, some, if they're new believers, and back in Pentecost, they've been to church for 30 years or more. And he says, by this time you ought to be teachers. You should be teaching other people, but you need someone to teach you. What was the problem here? Was it IQ? They didn't have enough smarts. They didn't have enough intelligence. No. It's SIQ. What's SIQ? Your spiritual IQ. Meaning that you learn doctrine by walking in fellowship with God. See? So it's not a matter of having the smarts of, oh, they're so intelligent. Well, they may have knowledge, but many times people lack wisdom. You have brilliant people who have the dumbest policies or say the dumbest things. It's called wisdom. Look it up in Proverbs. But here... You should already be teaching other people. You have need some teaching the ABCs, notice the oracles of God. Later on, chapter 6, verse 1, it's mentioned some of the ABCs. These are the basics of Christian doctrine. You should be teaching others, but you don't even know the basics. And that's what happens with carnality. You forget what you've already acquired. And you come and need a milk and not solid food. You're a little baby on the bottle. You can't handle advanced doctrine. That's a sign of immaturity. Now, every believer starts out as a baby. <laughs> you know, Paul says, well, or Peter says, remember, I think it was 1 Peter 3, 1, as newborn babes desire the what? Sincere milk of the word that we might grow thereby. We need milk. A babe needs to start out with milk. But notice it's the desire. A babe, gotta have it, gotta have it. You ever knew, you're a new believer, gotta have it, guy. Just can't devour the word of God enough. And I just... And so unfortunately, we lose that hunger. You know, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Got to have it. But here, they're dull of hearing. It's like, yeah, okay, all right. Hit and miss. It's okay. No, it's all right. Take it or leave it. And here, we're like a baby on the bottom. And you should be an adult. It's one thing to see a baby four or five years old. It's another thing to see a baby... And they're thinking 25, 30 years old. And that's a tragedy. And Christians are like that. Can't handle sound doctrine. Can't handle detailed doctrine. Everyone who uses, partakes of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. He is a babe. The solid food belongs to those who are full age. That, what's the issue here? Maturity. Full age maturity. Not babyhood status. 
That's a context going into Hebrews 6, okay? Um, because chapter 6, as the key, I think, therefore leaving the ABCs. You know, believers, you're still on the model, you're still on the milk. Let's leave the basics and go on to, here's the key word here in this passage, perfection. The word teleos means to reach a goal, and the goal is spiritual maturity. Let's go on to maturity. Let's be an adult Christian that can handle detailed doctrine. Let's go on to maturity. We're not going to go over the basics again. And he lists several doctrines. We're not going to get to them. Basic Jewish doctrines of baptism, you know, resurrection from the dead, eternal judgment, some of the basics of prophecy. Uh, you know, we'll go on to maturity if God permits. Meaning that some believers, if they continue drifting away from the truth, going back into the old time religion of Judaism, not maturing the faith, they reach a danger point in their life that they might not grow anymore as a Christian. And they're set and locked in to negavolition. The impossibility here is not salvation as far as going to heaven, but they reach a point where they will not grow anymore as a believer to spiritual maturity. You had your opportunity to grow, you rejected it, you're not going back, and you're going to remain like the children of Israel. Keep in mind the passage about the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. And this is behind the Kadesh Barnea incident. We need to understand the historical teaching to understand Hebrews 6. What happened when the spies were sent? Remember, they were sent into the land. A good report, you know, the land represented maturity, by the way, not heaven. Canaan doesn't represent heaven. It re represents the mature believer fighting the giants in the battles, you know. It doesn't, you know, in heaven, obviously, you don't have to fight the Amalekites. So, it represents the mature believer. They did not believe what happened. They disbelieved. Now, there was a little group that said, oh, we're going to go back. We changed our mind. After seeing God's judgment, we change our mind. We're going to go. Uh, you're not going to succeed. You might go, but you're, it's impossible now. You're going to, you're going to be defeated. They were defeated. And what did the children of Israel do? They remained out of the land for 40 years. Couldn't go into Jordan, cross the Jordan, as Joshua did in the next generation. They remained in the desert for 40 years. And here the warning in Hebrews 6, where believers are going back, and this is a serious thing. They were going back to Judaism, rejecting the finished work sacrifice of Christ, and ritualism, basically religion. It would be like a believer knowing the truth and going back into Catholicism or ritual. Let's go back to doing this, and, you know. Let's go back to praying the statues, praying to Mary, and, and all the other ritual telling a priest my sins, and uh, all the other ritualism, religion. After knowing grace, after knowing grace. And so this is a serious thing. Now, they'll be reached a point where they won't grow the spiritual maturity. Let's look at this. It is impossible those who, now, notice five things he described, five ways he describes these people. I don't see how you can look at these things and say they were unsaved. Now, Calvinists try to do that, but it doesn't match up to the Word of God. First thing, once in my botizo. That word is, same Greek word is used only 100 times in Hebrews. It's used in Hebrews 10. And they were illuminated after they, they when they believed the gospel, they were illuminated and helped the author there. It refers to genuine faith. That Hebrews chapter 10, this word is repeated again. In that context, it shows that that person is genuinely saved. They come to the light of the truth. They want some light. They have tasted the heavenly good. Jesus partook of death. That's a full taste. Calvinists say, well, they just sampled it, but they didn't really believe. No, Jesus partook of death. That word tasted is used of Christ's death, Hebrews 2. They received the heavenly gift. They become partners with the Holy Spirit. How can an unsaved person become a partner with the Holy Spirit? Same person. Notice. They tasted the good word of God and the power of the coming age. 
So these five terms describe a genuine believer. Genuine believer. If they fall away, we have a participle in the Greek, having fallen away. So if they who have done these things, having fallen away, it would be impossible to renew them to repentance. Going back to the beginning, starting all over again. Now we're going to go back to be a mature Christian. It's too late now. And you can't do it, especially going back to ritualism, because in ritualism they were crucifying the Son of God and putting to him an open chain. By going back to the sacrificial system, slaughtering animals when the temple was still exist in existence, you're denying the sufficiency of the one-time sacrifice of Christ. You're installing the Holy Spirit who saved you by God's grace. You're going from grace to legalism. That's the issue here. And you're shaming the Lord. And you'll be under divine discipline. He talks about the productivity of the earth. Again, about like the parable of the soils, you know. The earth drinks in the rain. It bear, bears herbs when it's cultivated. God blesses it. But if it produces thorns, it's rejected. You don't want ground full of thorns. You want a ground that bears fruit. So it's rejected and being near to cursed. Notice that. Whose end is to be burned. Now, burning there doesn't mean hell. Now, this can be, as we saw in 1 Timothy, a, uh, uh, you can burn ground to clear all the thorns away and produce a new crop. So it's possible here that he says, you know, if they recover some from this, they will produce a new crop. Although, though, he can refer to also works being burned at the judgment seat of Christ. For this believer, it'll be wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, he says in verse 9, he's not contrasting saved and unsaved, he's contrasting carnal and spiritual. Understand this. But beloved, we are confident of better things than you, from you, things that accompany salvation, thus we speak. Once again, we have to ask what the word salvation means. Now, here in Hebrews, it's referring to reward and rulership with Christ in the kingdom. And things that accompany that reward, in order to get that reward, you need to persevere. And that's why in verse 10 and 11, he talks about things that accompany salvation and the following content. If you want a reward, you have to be, you have to persevere. God will not forget what you've done. And notice verse 11, we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Don't go back to legalism. Continue to exercise hope unto the end. So perseverance is necessary not to go to heaven, but to receive reward. And the whole thing, the whole context here is a believer who fails to do that. And notice we come full circle in Hebrews 5.11, we call it inclusio in Greek. This is an inclusio. We begin with the idea of being dull of hearing, and he says, verse 12, that you do not become sluggish lazy in your hearing, but imitate those who through faith and perseverance, here's the whole key, Pay faith and perseverance inherit the promises. You want a reward as a Christian? Persevere. Don't become lazy in your hearing. Okay, we're going to wrap this up with a visual. So if you're still awake here, or maybe this will wake you up. Here's the option, low road or high road for the believer. You're saved by God's grace through faith, foundation, laid the foundation. Christ is the foundation. It's by grace. You have the upward path, the high road to maturity. You have the low road. The Bible says, let's go up here. Let's take this road. Let's go up, onward and upward. Paul says, a press toward the prize for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's the high road. I want to exercise full assurance of hope to the end. I want to persevere to the end. It's not guaranteed. And I want to reach that point of spiritual maturity. Maturity is not the end of your life. It's, you can still grow as a mature Christian. But I want to be a baby. I want strong meat. 514, notice that. And reach the goal. The goal is reward. I inherit the promise. That's the goal. And I have a copy of this. I can email you if you want. Things that accompany salvation. I want better things so that I'll reach this goal. 
I want the want to persevere so I'll reach that goal. Or I can take the loser route, go back to the old time religion, be like a baby now on the milk, being lazy in my hearing, Hebrews 5, 11, Hebrews 6, 12, being near the judgment, near the curse, before you cross that point of no return. This is a point of no return. And that's the point of no return to what? Spiritual maturity, Hebrews 6, 8. I crucify at that point the Son of God, going back to religion. And what's my end? Two ends. Works burnt to the judgment seat of Christ. That's my end. Versus the end here, inheriting the promises. Two options. Two roads a believer can take. The high calling, the upper road, or the loser route. The loser road. I hope you take the upper road to the high calling. That's by our hands. Father, thank you, Lord, for it. The scripture, we pray as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we might be a winner Christian. We might continue to persevere by faith, continue to desire the milk of the word so that we might grow thereby, and then continue under advanced doctrine, Father, all the way to spiritual maturity and beyond, that we might be rewarded, well done, good and faithful servant at the judgment seat of Christ. Help us not to be a loser, be like those who are distracted by the things of the world, or even the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But pursue your plan and will. If you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, salvation is clearly a free gift. It's by God's grace. Christ died on the cross for your sins. He rose bodily from the dead the third day so that he can give you life. All you need to do is place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, I know it's over, but I'll just hit the high points on the notes here. Um, we have an event coming up, a trip to Glen Rose on April 4th, uh, Saturday.